I'm Dale Brenneman. I'm with the Office of Ethnohistorical Research at the Arizona State Museum. And um, I'm joined tonight by my colleagues on the uh, Auth and Pipash Documentary History Project. Bernard Siqueiros over here to my right is uh, the Curator of Education at the Tono Autumn Nation Cultural Center and Museum. I'll Good let, evening. I'll let Bernard tell you the, the autumn name of the museum. Uh, the autumn name of the museum is Himdaki Hukyuhumu in Bihap, which means uh, way of life house or cultural house, past, present, and into the future. I can get about as far as Himdaki, and, <laughs> and that's it. Um, to my left here is Ronald Geronimo. Ronald is a linguist and he is an instructor in language and culture at the Tona Otham Community College. And to my right here immediately is Rodrigo Renteria. He is a graduate student in the School of Anthropology at the University of Arizona. And he is one of the graduate students working on our project. I am gonna say we also have a couple other graduate students here in the crowd. Uh, Lucero Radunich is right here, and Monica Young, and both of them have been working on the project for a number of years. So, we have the introductions done, and we'll get started. I have a couple of people I'd like to introduce. Okay. Uh, I'd like to introduce a gentleman who just came on board at the museum as a mu museum administrator, uh, Michael Reinschmidt. Michael? He's our new administrator. Welcome. And also, uh, we have uh, Joe Joaquin, who many of you know, who is our cultural resource specialist for the Thaw Notham Nation, here with us, <laughs> along with uh, uh, our right hand at the museum, Alice Sami, who is our administrative assistant. Alice, please stand. And then at the far end, oh, there's somebody trying to hide, I think, is uh, Jeanette Garcia, who is our librarian archivist. And then Alice brought her son and his friends, so we're glad they're here also. So we've primed the audience. Okay. Okay, the um, Autumn Peepash Documentary History Project uses the Spanish documentary record to explore the um, history of the Autumn and Peepash peoples during the uh, Spanish colonial and early Mexican periods. And it is a, um, and I, sh I should clarify, many people probably don't recognize the term pipash, and that is the name that the Maricopas call themselves by. We all have heard of the Maricopas, but they really uh, prefer the term pipash, and uh, we're happy to help them get that word out. Um, like the Hopi Documentary History Project, which Tom Sheridan was here a year ago talking about, this is a collaborative effort. And we hope through this collaboration to be um, able to broaden our understanding of historical encounters and interactions among the Otham and Pipash and Spaniards and Mexicans and also other neighboring groups. And I want to say before we get too far that we are in our um, sixth year of this project and we've received funding from the National Historical Publications and Records Commission um, consistently throughout. And we've also received funding from the Southwestern Foundation for Education and Historical Preservation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we're very grateful for that support that we've gotten. Okay, um, I think a lot of you, I see a lot of known faces here in the crowd, and a lot of you know what the Office of Documentary, I'm sorry, the Office of Ethnohistorical Research is. Um, but for those of you who don't, I guess one of our biggest claims to fame is we have this incredible microfilm collection of copies of documents from archives in Mexico, Spain, Rome, um, and various institutions in the U.S., including um, the Bancroft Library at Berkeley and uh, a few documents from the Benson in um, Austin. So it's a tremendous resource for researchers, and we, we do get researchers 
from all over the country and sometimes from other parts of the world as well to come um, access these records. The, um, the Office of Ethnohistorical Research uses this collection as well. And for about three decades now, we've been producing documentary histories. Um, there's two series primarily, and, and one has uh, focused on the Presidio and militia system of the northern frontier. Um, there are four volumes out on that, and the fifth one is hopefully nearing completion. And then we also have a Native People series, and the Hopi project that Tom talked about last year is part of that series, as well as this project that we're working on and we're talking about tonight. Okay, the Spanish documentary record is um, a really rich resource for information about Native peoples. It uh, gives us a lot of information about how people lived, uh, where they were on the landscape, how they um, acquired their food, how they farmed, how they dressed, um, and, ha and uh, interactions that they had, encounters that they had with Spaniards at the time of contact and through the, the colonial period. But there's uh, a major shortcoming to that record, and that is the fact that because Native peoples, most Native peoples, did not read or write and could not record in written form, their perspective were left with a very European perspective on what happened. It's a very biased record. It's just an inherent part of the, of the record. And it all, because all of this information comes through a European filter, we have to try to find a way around that. Even in cases where we have, um, say, testimonies, for example, from indigenous individuals, those are coming to us through at least one filter and probably two. Most testimonies were delivered through an interpreter, so you're getting um, some changes there. And then they were recorded by a, a notary or a scribe. And often, um, you know, scribes then did not record things like we think about in, um, say, criminal proceedings today where everything is taken down word for word. They were basically summarizing the proceedings. And they would often follow a strict format for doing that. So it's going through that extra filter, and even when we get the supposedly the words of the indigenous individual, we can't. We, we have to read between the lines on that. So as a way to try to to counter or offset this inherent bias in the record, we are collaborating with, in this case, the Autumn and Pipash. Um, communities to um, get their perspective on the, the record. The um, approach involves collaborating with tribal representatives in selecting documents and then producing commentary on them. The idea here is to draw upon the insights and the oral traditions of tribal scholars and elders to counterbalance that inherent bias in the record. In this project, we're working the most closely with the Tona Atham Nation through Himdag Ki. And I will note that um, that's particularly important in this project because it was the Tona Atham who were the most, um, had the most consistent contact with Spanish missionaries and settlers, Spanish settlement. So some of the parameters of the project Are, um, we're working from a time period that starts in the mid-1600s. These are the earliest encounters of Jesuit missionaries with the easternmost Otham. And we're, this is even before Father Kino reached the region. And then we're taking the project up to the ratification of the Gadsden Purchase in 1854, when a large swath of 
mostly autumn, but also partly Peaposh territory was uh, incorporated into the United States of America. The geographic range uh, includes what Spaniards called the Pimaria Alta. And we've had a map distributed um, to everybody so that you can see what uh, the boundaries were. It's roughly bounded by the Gila River to the north, the San Pedro to the east, the uh, Magdalena Altar drainage to the south, and then the Colorado River and the Gulf of California to the west. And when Kino first arrived um, in this region, he found it widely inhabited by various groups of Autumn, whom he identified as Pimas, um, Sobas, Sobiparis, and Papagos. The Papagos today we um, know as the Tona Atham, properly so. Then at the northern fringe along the Gila River, he encountered neighboring groups of Pipash, who were human speakers, and he identified them as Cocomera, Copas, and Opas. And what we find interesting is his mention of uh, bilingual speakers, even at this time, um, indicates that you had some, some measure of interaction between these two groups. Um, today, uh, three of the four Autumn nations also have a uh, Peaposh component. Okay, the, the documents themselves, we're translating approximately 80 documents or document groups. Um, this is, comes from a universe of more than 400 possibilities that we were able to find in our own microfilm collection um, at the Office of Ethnohistorical Research. And the documents include travel diaries, reports, and letters that are written by missionaries and various colonial officials, um, legal inquest files from criminal proceedings or investigations of revolts, um, books written by Kino and um, Captain Juan Mateo Manje, who tra often traveled with Kino, and census reports, and then letters and reports from the early Mexican period as well. We've um, gone down to the, visit the archive in Hermosillo and have come back with some um, both paper and digital copies of documents from there. The document selection reflects the goals that have been developed in consultation with the, um, aut our autumn colleagues. And essentially we're working with documents that describe Autumn and Peaposh environment, customs and subsistence, interactions with Spanish and Mexican people and their institutions, and interactions with neighboring native communities as well. The process is um, long. <laughs> it's just long. <laughs> and it involves a lot of steps. Uh, which begins with OER staff and students, first of all, um, uh, may, uh, identifying the universe of documents to select from. Um, as I said, there were, we, we came up with more than 400 documents that were possibilities, and we had to work to narrow those down. Um, we transcribed the documents from handwritten to typewritten Spanish. Um, summarize their contact, and then translate them from Spanish into English. It's a, that's where the length really comes in. It's a very interpretive process. Um, it involves having to interpret the handwriting, the abbreviations, the variable spelling, little or no punctuation, and as well as the meaning of the words. So it's uh, takes quite a while. Then there's the verification process, which again adds to the time. Um, in our office, we work as a team. Uh, we have uh, currently, I think, eight or nine graduate students working on this project. Um, we will have one person uh, who will do a transcription. Another person will verify that transcription. 
One person will translate a document, another person will verify that translation. If it's a particularly difficult document, we might get see a second or third verification as well. Our team is made up of both native Spanish speakers and native English speakers, and this is a really important aspect to it. We find that the uh, native Spanish speakers can handle the transcription much more quickly than a native English speaker. And if you think about it, when you're trying to read somebody's really bad handwriting, how often do you rely on your intuitive understanding of your language to identify what some words are. So it's, it just speeds up the process remarkably. Um, with our translations, we will start those out with a native English speaker. And the verification may be done um, either by another native English speaker or a native Spanish speaker. But in all of these documents, we will have the, Spani the native Spanish speakers look at the translations to make sure that we're not making some egregious mistakes. So there's, you can see where all this time comes in. Uh, we are, as I said, in the middle of our sixth year. And I'm delighted to report we have almost all the transcriptions done. We're going to add, I think, about five more. Otherwise, we, we are complete. Um, the translations, the, the first run through, are almost all done. Probably more than half of those have been verified. Um, we also have an annotation process where all of these uh, documents are placed into context by annotating um, names, places, just getting that basic information down. Um, graduate students handle all of the initial transcription, translation, and annotation. And some of them are now um, beginning to work on some introductions to documents as well. Okay, now then as the, as the documents are translated and annotated, we start turning them over to the, our autumn colleagues, uh, Bernard and Ronald here, who um, discuss them with a group of autumn elders. And uh, Bernard will talk to you about that process. And um, I will just say that the, um, the discussion sessions which they conduct are conducted in autumn. They're recorded and then summarized by Ronald into English. And the summaries, which are uh, discussed with the elders to verify accuracy, um, will form the basis of written commentary that will be prepared by Ronald and Bernard and included in the published volume. We're um, still playing with what form that this will finally take, but what we're shooting for are some kind of epilogues that will follow the, the documents or groups of documents, um, providing some autumn perspective on, on what the documents say. So with that, um, I'll be turning this over to Bernard, but before we, he gets started, I will say that um, Ronald will be talking about um, some of the language information that is available in the documents. Um, the, many of the place names we are, are uh, provided in autumn by the Spaniards, autumn place names, but it's their renderings of them. And uh, Ronald has been working on trying to figure out exactly uh, what place names are the Spaniards trying to say, and then what do those place names mean, and, and it helps them identify where places were on the landscape. And um, Rodrigo here will be talking about what has pulled him into this project and um, how he's bringing his research interests into it. So take it away, Bernard. So after uh, a couple of initial meetings back six years ago, was it? My gosh, time flies. Yeah. <laughs> um, we finally um, realized that we really needed to pull together a uh, a, a group of, of elders to help us in this discussion. Uh, Joe Joaquin and I were uh, 
kind of appointed the lead on this project for the nation. And um, so we began to discuss uh, and throw out some names of individuals that we thought might be willing to uh, assist us in this project. And uh, we, had to, we had to get started. And so uh, we were somewhat aware of, of uh, one of Father Kino's uh, journeys that, that led him through kind of the, the central portion of our lands. If you look at that map, it's now the kind of the southern portion of, of, of our nation today. And so we wanted to start with that. And I think the date on that was 19, or 1698? I think 16. 1699. I think. Oh, no, no, 99. 1699. But it was, we felt that this would be a, a good place to start because it was, it was through, through an area that, that, that we can identify with. And so we pulled together uh, several elders. Um, uh, Felix Anton, who is the governor of the Autumn in Mexico, uh, agreed to help us in this process. Uh, we asked uh, a young man that really was not an elder, but uh, but he had he had a lot of knowledge about his area. He had a lot of knowledge of the um, geography of the area that Father Kino came through. So we asked him if he would if he would join us, and he he suggested that we ask his mother as well, because his mother was elder, and his mother knew many of the things that he knew. And so we asked. Um, um, his mother to join us. This is uh, um, Rosaline, Rosaline uh, Sarapo and um, Jacob. Jacob Sarapo. And then, uh, so we also asked a gentleman from the community of Santa Cruz, which is in, uh, in Pisinma district, Jose uh, Garcia, who also agreed to, to sit with us. And uh, so this was the initial core group that came together. Uh, we also invited uh, Tony Burrell from the Santa uh, Cultural uh, Affairs Office, and uh, of course, Joe Wakin and I. So we began to meet, and the first um, um, document that we presented was the document that brought Father Kino and Captain Manhe through through our through our lands, and it was very interesting in, in, in reading through that and discussing it at various geological points and the stories that went with some of those areas and things that, that, they, that they were told uh, about certain areas and some of the stories that went with them. And uh, uh, well, all the time trying to, trying to encourage them to, to provide that autumn uh, aspect, that autumn perception. I mean, this, this, we kept reminding them that these documents that we were reading were written, were, were written through the eyes of the Spanish, uh, Father Kino and, and Captain Manje, or actually it was Captain Manje that, that wrote that. Uh, very descriptive of the land, and uh, so we could identify with that. And um, the one thing that, that I remember from that first discussion was that uh, uh, Captain Manhe kept talking about all the different places they stopped and the number of people that were that they would meet and and the baptisms that went on and the and the, the sermons I guess that went on with them prior to baptism and then uh, and and referring to the autumn as somewhat industrious because of the need to survive in the land they were in until they came to a place called Sean um, Oidak or Gaur Sean Oidak which is Sonoita today. And that was an autumn village there. And uh, Captain Manhe refers to the men in this village as being less than industrious. <laughs> and he says that there was, they, seemed, uh, they appear to be less than industrious because their fields are very small. You know, and yet they had a source of water with the, with the river there. And so we, we looked at this and we began to discuss it. And it was, I think it was Mr. Anton that said they were not lazy. They only planted what they needed. They didn't overplant, and through time they knew what they needed. And so they were, they were still hard workers, but they did what they needed to do. And so again, they, they, these were through the eyes of the autumn, and the Spanish saw them as being less industrious because of all the fertile land that had been left unfarmed. And so, so we, we with that, we began to encourage them. These are the these are the ways we want to look at these documents. You know, we, we need to try to put that our perspective on them, what we think may be our perspective. 
And so they gave us a good start. Uh, it was a little confusing at first because um, in, in, in the journey as it went up along the, the, the Gila River and back east, there were some uh, discussion of uh, people that had come uh, to greet them uh, carrying crosses and bows. And we had a long discussion on what are crosses and bows. We couldn't understand that. Then we finally realized that we were, we were reading uh, a journal that was written long after contact had already been made. And that, uh, and that these crosses and bows finally were the crosses, of course, uh, the religious cross, but the bows were arches that many of our people use today in their, in their processions, their religious processions. We call them kilhot or rainbows because they're made and they're, and, they're, and they're decorated with flowers and they're very pretty. And so this is what we saw at that time. Um, and we, we were wondering wh how, I mean, I think Mr. Joaquin said it best at one time when he said, we need to remember that when the Spanish came, they had a cross in one hand and a sword in the other. And so we had a lot of discussion on whether or not we were, we were really being as welcoming to these new people or, or were we doing this out of fear that if, if, we did, if we didn't welcome them or didn't conform that we would be, I don't know, harmed or something. And so there was a, 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 a lot of that type of discussion that, uh, that, that makes this project very interesting um, because I grew up, as many of our kids do, with very little information about Atham in our history books. You know, and that's something that, that has, has always been a curiosity to me about our histories. And so when, when, we, were, when we were invited to participate in a project that would have us take a look at our history, we saw it as a very good thing because these are things that our children need to know that these things need to be documented so we can share these things with our children so that they can have a better idea of, uh, of who we are as a people. And so um, uh, initially we brought on uh, three students from Tohon Autumn Community College to, to serve as interns on this project. And uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were very excited about the things they were learning. And uh, they were also very excited about the field trips that we planned, because any project has to have a field trip to make it very exciting. <laughs> and so our first field trip was to go down into Mexico to, to, to follow Father Kino's route from an area we call Chuda Guaya, or Green Well. Green, uh, green Well. In, in the document, they call it Eulalia. And uh, Mr. Lo Mr. Anton was able to identify that area uh, that was discussed in the document. And so we followed uh, Father Kino's route through places like Sha'ark in our language, Sardik today, Chiutam uh, in our language, Tupitama today, um, Magdalena, which is what Ronald can explain all of this, but to Magdalena, to, the, to Dolores, and then from there we could, s we could understand why he took the routes that he did because of the, the canyon or the valleys that were open. And so we went, there of course there was nothing at uh, Dolores, but we went up to Cocospora at the church there. And, uh, and it, just, it just made it much more interesting to see these areas that Father Kino had, had visited on these tours. And the students were very excited about that. Um, in fact, we've taken tours on our own nation to areas that he came through looking at some of the, the old sites. And so it's just a very worthwhile project and I'm very anxious to continue to work on this. Um, we've moved on into the early 1700s now and uh, there's a little more discussion. Uh, we're getting to the, the revolt of the autumn uh, simply because there was a time where 
I think some, one of the elders said it best when we asked, why do you think we were <laughs> revolting? And he was like, well, enough is enough. You know, when you're mistreated the way we, we seem to have been, there was a time where people just said, enough is enough, we need to take a stand. And that's where we're at now, so we're very excited at mo about moving forward from there. Um, I will be happy to answer any questions you might have after, but I want to take save some, save some time for Ronald because he has some very interesting uh, information on some of the names of these communities. <laughs> As um, they mentioned, uh, that I, I my part in the project is is to translate the recordings that we did with the elders, and a lot of it is in autumn. So, and um, and I work with the college. Uh, well, I teach at the college so language and culture. So this is uh, a part of m you know my own um, my own desires and my own passion to to know more about our autumn language and so the project really uh, helps me in that way but it also helps the you know the project and so you know I do those but another part of the you know that they are mentioned is is trying to figure out the the place names that were mentioned in the documents um, early on when we were reading the documents we kind of skipped over the place names they didn't it didn't really, we were really looking at you know, the, what was in there and and trying to get our own perspective of what um, the documents were about. But uh, as we kept going along, we, we wanted to know where are these places that are mentioned in these documents? Are they still there? You know, do the people still live there? And um, And the reason that we kind of skipped over those names, the place names, was because they were unfamiliar to us. Most of, um, you know, for my own self, I thought they were just um, uh, s places in Mexico with uh, s Spanish names or, because when the documents, when, when they came to a place, they would describe how many people were there, how many homes, and then they would say, uh, and we named this place, um, San Pedro y San Pablo de Del Tubutama. And so we just kind of, I kind of took that as the whole name that, that was given by Kino until uh, later on in one of the sessions uh, we were talking about Tubutama and one of the elders, Felix, said Jodam, you know, that, that place is called Jodam. And, and so we kind of, um, at that point, figured out that the the name the place already had an autumn name, and then Kino was just giving it a saint name to go along with it. So we started to look more at the ending of the names rather than in the beginning, and trying to figure out um, what what that name was because even though we knew that it was an autumn name, it was still unfamiliar to us. It didn't look autumn. It didn't sound autumn, and. Um, but having that from Felix, him knowing that that place is called Chiu Dam, and also um, going along with some some place names that were already familiar to us on the on the nation, that um, that have, I I guess you would call the Spanish writing, of how the autumn pronounced it, and we. Uh, oh, When you so Tubutama is spelled like this and in, in um in autumn in, in the writing system that we use, Chudam is It's spelled like this, and so we can see that um, you know this is two words. Uh, Tubutama sounds like one word, but Chudam is two words. Chu meaning uh, long or tall, 
and dam meaning on top, you know, top of something. So chu dam, and, and when we did go to her Tubutama, we stopped before we got to the to the place over on a hill, and Felix was showing us the mountain range that the place was named after. So he he was really uh, instrumental in helping us uh, figure out some of these names, but there were others that uh, he didn't know, so it had to you know fall on us to try to figure out those names and um w and going along we kind of uh figured out that in in spanish the b sound it would go to a w or either the sometimes they used a v which also went to a w and then um this the tu usually was our ch sound so uh, i mean if you go if you do two sound You know, that's the same way you have that TU, and for us we call it Tucson, Chukron. Also, two words, meaning black and then base, Chukron. So I always tell people um, the C is not silent, it's <laughs> Chukron. <laughs> in, in Spanish, I think they say Tucson. So, so I say, yeah, the C is not silent. It's it should be pronounced. Um, so again, the ch sound with the tu that kind of gave us a clue. So when we see that tu sound, we try to I mean the, the tu writing, we try to put in that ch sound. And then um, one of the other things that we noticed with the Spanish writing is that they added a lot of vowels at the end of words. Sometimes they weren't there in, in autumn. But for whatever reason, I, I'm just now starting to uh, kind of research Spanish, the, the sound system, uh, during, during this project. So they have a lot of um, vowel sounds in the end. So if we look at Chudam, Tubutama, you know, they have the A in the end. But that was probably just an added on um, sound. Um, we can't see it on here, but sometimes they would drop the, a consonant at the end of a word. So if we had, um, if we had a word that had, um, well, there was one place called, Tutum Oida, um, Tutum Oida, I guess. It will be, and, and, and again, you have the TU, so it was like ch ch. And uh, we, we kind of, you know, looked at it and, and, and sounding it out, chu chum oita, chu chum oita. Which uh, in autumn, chu chum oita, what means small fields. So, one of the things that we noticed about these place names, which is still um, like that in, on the nation, is that a lot of our, you know, the autumn had uh, field villages and well villages. So, a lot of the places had either oita at the end, which is field, or wahui, which is a well. And so, we, we would see that in those writings. Um, not the the whole spelling, but part of it. Like I said, here, the G um, probably dropped off, so it, instead of oida, it just went to oida. The same with um, um, the the place that Bernard mentioned, uh, Sonoita. Sonoita. Um, Which uh, in autumn we say Shon Aidak. Shon Aidak. Shon, again coming from uh, uh, the base, and Aidak being a fear, Shon Aidak. So we, we worked through that process trying to look for those clues and, and um, trying to figure out those names and we were able to, to, some of them were real clear, but others were still kind of hard to figure out, and we're still trying to figure out some of them. It, it's real hard to try to, uh, to
to try to figure out because some of them were sounding the same or similar. So we weren't really sure what, what it was. And, uh, and Bernard mentioned uh, Magdalena. Uh, if you ask Autumn, you know, what's the Autumn name for Magdalena? They would say Marina. Um, that, and that's just an Autumn pronunciation of Magdalena. And I'm not sure if, if anybody really knows the real name. But in one of the documents, it, it did have that, that ending part. And it was, it was um, Ukuibawa or something like that. And that was one of the ones that was real hard to figure out. Um, although I've learned that Spanish Q, U, I, they usually just skip the U sound and go to ki. So uk, uk is what we came up with. Uk meaning high. And then again with the, this going to a W. And then dropping off the A. Uh, we said that it could be uk wow. Uk wow, meaning a high cliff wall or a high um, piece of rock that stands up that um, is just kind of like solid rock. And so we were, we were talking about that and, and I didn't notice, but uh, Bernard mentioned that there is a big cliff wall over here in, by Marina, by Magdalena, kind of southwest of that. There's a big cliff wall right there. So it, we thought that's probably what uh, the name is. And um, I think, you know, doing all these and finding out the, the place names of those um, play, places mentioned in the document, you know, that, that it's good. And, and because as Bernard said, our history, there's not much written on our history uh, in that area. You know, we know a lot about this area. We can say that, you know, we still call Chuson, Chukshon, when we, we talk in Aata. We still say Chukshon, but we don't say Ukwao when we say Marina because we don't know that. We don't see it written anywhere. And, um, so this is one of the things that's coming out of the project that our history can be told. And, and when when Autumn go into Mexico and they they hear the um, the names of places down there, they just you know think it's just a a, um, a city in Mexico with a Spanish name. They don't think about that this place used to be Autumn an Autumn village with Autumn living there. So. Uh, we hope that with this project, um, our, our, our children, um, the autumn, will learn more about their history and be able to, well, I say, connect back to, the, to those places and, and where it will have more special meaning to them. Uh, you know, the only place that we really uh, talk about now is Magdalena because of the pilgrimage to to, uh, during St. Francis Day. But now, um, you know, there's other places where Autumn lived and Autumn, our ancestors lived. So I think one of the, the biggest things to come out is also to have that history for our, the people that are following us to know. Because um, I think Felix kind of mentioned one time that he wasn't too sure about this project and he wasn't too... Uh, um, didn't know if he really wanted to do this, but after you know hearing all these things, he said, you know, our children should know these things. We need to pass it on. So whatever you guys learn, you know, and he's he's elder, and he talks about you know whatever you guys learn, you need to pass it on to 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 the children, so they'll know because we never knew this. We never knew this that all this existed, and now that you're bringing it out, you guys need to you guys need to work on it and put it out there so. You know, all the autumn know that you can just go somewhere and, and learn about those places in, in Mexico that were autumn villages. So that's it. Okay. Um, as John, John Steinbach, a great American writer, embarked to explore the Sea of Cortez in the 1960s, he came to the understanding that any object, any person, any 
uh, place words created in a piece of paper. Every object in this reality had multiple understandings, multiple truths. And in that regard, he questioned, so how do we find out what is the truth that is relevant for us? He questioned this and he answered. The answer he found as he was exploring the Sea of Cortez is uh, uh, a fish, for instance, can have an ecological truth, like it has X number of spines. But then uh, the, tr my, the truth that is relevant for me is that of my engagement with that thing, with that object, with that person. So it's based on, it's on, the, on this long-term sustained engagement with things and objects and people that truths, that are, truths become relevant for us. Uh, in that sense, colonial documents contain multiple truths, multiple voices, are multiple instances of mediation uh, in a single document. As Del was explaining, the person could grow the intentions that person had for writing that specific letter in a given moment in time uh, about a specific set of people uh, in all these very complex social dimensions, right? So in that regard, um, for me as an anthropologist, as a Mexican anthropologist um, working at this project, it's been a wonderful opportunity to um, see how many of these truths start to take form, start to become organized in different kinds of hierarchies as my engagement with these documents starts to speak to me, have started to speak to me. Before working in, those, in this project, I work as an anthropologist in Mexico. I have the privilege and honor to take uh, part of like uh, certain aspects of the Tohono Odam life on both sides of the border. And I had that glimpse of Tohono, Tohono Odam reality. But then in this project, as I have worked, for instance, a more than seven, almost a year in the Pima Revolt on 1751, a more nuanced understanding of who the Odam were in the 17th, 18th century starts to like emerge and in front of me and I, as I spend as many of the grad students here like enormous amount of time reading and over reading the documents and then you you these truths that may at the beginning like um, sounds like noise and just like oh just a colonial document written by this authority you start to have a more nuanced understanding of it so in that regard and because of I guess the shortness of time here. Um, I will uh, just say that the the product of all this long-term engagement uh, that is devoted in this project with this document documents is producing the, the probably the best kind of history, research history that can be done. That is the a one that contains an enormous amount of time in its production. So in that regard, uh, we hope that many of all these engagements don't end with the publication of the books as Bernard, as Bernard and, uh, 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 sorry, Ronald, <laughs> sorry, uh, were saying, uh, this is just the beginning. This is not something that must end in written words because actually all this began before words were written when actually just the word of those people present here were never represented in the colonial documents. So this is a larger process and, and our engagement as researchers, as community with all these documents should be, should be, should continue and, and, and I keep going. So pretty much it. Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and open the floor to questions now, and um, if you don't feel like asking a question out loud, there are pads and pieces of paper, or pencils, um, pads of pieces of paper, pencils and pens, <laughs> feel free to write your question down, and um, I'll be happy to collect the questions as I walk around and read them when we get a chance. Um, I misplaced my reading glasses, so write big. <laughs> okay, so uh, we are open to questions, and I see one right in the back. Oh, cool. <laughs> How did they get back here? <laughs> May I borrow this question? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a little too strong for me, thanks. Uh, one of the things that I was uh, wondering about is that uh, we have relatively little information about how uh, agriculture and uh, basically periods of con uh, contact and uh, I was wondering if the documents that you're uh, translating uh, go into any details on on the agriculture, how, what their practices were, uh, how they located uh, farming areas, things of this sort. 
Um, the, the documents that relate to uh, Father Kino's um, journey through the San Pedro River Valley and the Santa Cruz on up north along the Gila River make reference to the fields that were the, the, that they had the the um, the squash that they grew and the, the melons and and other kinds of foods that that they grew and shared with these people as they came through. So um, those are the references that we see in these documents. Uh, we saw very little uh, documentation on floodwater farming. At least I can't recall. Uh, Primarily uh, information on, on farms along the rivers and how uh, canals were dug off those rivers to, to bring water to their fields. Okay. There are some um, documents that make, I think, a slight reference to floodwater farming up along the Gila River, um, I think primarily among the Pipash communities. But in general, you're not going to get the kind of level of detail, Fred, that you would like to have. Um, we, we might get a mention of that there are acequias, that water is being brought to fields by acequias. But it doesn't give us any idea as to how the placement of those laid out. Um, and you know, often they'll just talk about um, that they're very fertile fields. And it might mention that it's along a river, but it doesn't mention specifically a sequias. So then we're left with the question of, is this because there weren't any or because somebody just didn't bother to mention them? And so that's, um, it's an ongoing question. And frankly, we'd like to talk with people like you <laughs> to better understand what the possibilities are of the different river systems. Not that you were around in that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe. I think we had a question over here. I have a very simple question. When your documentary is done, how does one access that? Is, will it be published through uh, a specific journal? And how does one access the previous one you did with the Hopi? Well, the Hopi, I'll, I'll address the Hopi one first. Um, that is going to be published in print. Um, it will be probably a big fat volume, um, knowing Tom. <laughs> and it will, um, it, the manuscript is in final preparation stages now. So it's, you know, hopefully, it, hopefully in a couple of years, but it'll, it'll take a while for it to, the manuscript has to be finished, then it has to be sent out for review and everything else, so it'll, it'll be a while. The, um, the Autumn Project, we are anticipating publishing in two volumes. Um, we'll divide those between the um, Jesuit and Franciscan mission periods following the lead of John Kessel that just makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons. But we're also toying with the idea um, as either an alternative or in addition to of publishing online. And that is something that, frankly, I still have to spend a lot of time exploring the ins and outs. Um, I, I love books. You know, I, I really like the print. But on the other hand, uh, there are so many cool things that could be done if it was done online. So it's something that we're thinking about now. We'll get the word out, though, when it's ready. Another question? One in the back. Uh, two questions. Um, do you have any sense from the documents as to the, uh, the numbers of people who might have been living in this area? And um, you had to cherry pick. Uh, your documents in order to, to do this. Any senses to any major things that you might have wished you could have gotten to but uh, were in other documents? I want to do them all. <laughs> there, there are um, numbers in that um, 
when the priests would come to a community, they would, they would mention the number of people that were baptized. And they would, uh, in fact, there was a gentleman uh, that was doing all the baptizing. Who? Orozco. Carrasco. Captain Carrasco. Captain Carrasco. In 1698. He was the godfather of the day. <laughs> I mean, he baptized hundreds of all of them, children and adults. And so um, we never did try to figure out exactly how many altogether, but it's hard to say because they give numbers for each communities and areas that they came through. But those were basically along the rivers. And uh, I don't think there were many numbers when they came actually through what's, what's our, our nation today. Um, but they, they do actually, um, it, it varied. If, it, if you had a priest who was record, making the recording, he usually counted souls. Um, and if, but Manhe counted houses. And then, like a good archaeologist, he tended to multiply the houses by about five <laughs> for an estimate of population. Um, I haven't gone through and totaled it all up, but it is something that we'll be looking at. One of the things that we're interested in is changes in demographics over that period of time, um, not just in numbers, but how it shifted around on the landscape, too. We have a question from the crowd. Um, are there Oadam traditions of storytelling, and do these stories, or if these stories exist, do they also help share uh, oral history? Uh, yes, uh, we have. Uh, winter time is when we tell stories, and so uh, uh, as we speak, there are other there are communities on our nation that have scheduled uh, storytelling evenings. Um, used to be where it was just a community, a, a small village, or maybe even a family that would come together and tell stories. But today, uh, it's, it's invitations go out, or it's advertised, and people may come and, and, and listen to some of these stories. Um, um, but it just depends on the community. Uh, I know that we've, uh, we've uh, scheduled uh, storytelling uh, down in Kitovak with uh, the kid, the autumn kids down in Kitovak, because uh, many of those kids in that community are, are like our kids here in the United States, where they're they're they speak English and know very little about their culture, while the kids in Kitovak are fluent in Espanol and but know very little about autumn, and so the um, the administrators there have asked that we come and and work with them and, and help these students get a better understanding of their culture and so, uh, of our culture rather. And so we've been doing that. And I know that uh, Ronald um, pulled together a number of his students to come down and, and tell stories with, with that group. So. And another thing besides the, the creation stories that are, you know, that we tell during the winter times and, well, none of the creation stories really mention anything about, I mean, in the, in the stories about the Spanish and, but the stories that um, that come out from the elders that are there and and I, I remember one that um, Felix told when we were talking about the the autumn fighting against um, the Spanish and he talked about how the autumn climbed you know on, onto Babakiri Peak and, and that mountain range to get away from 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 the Spaniards, and he talked about, and these were stories handed down to him by his father and probably uh, his father before that, and he talks about how they suffered up there and and how they, um, they didn't want to come down even after they were told that it was okay to come down, and then they were afraid to come down. They, they didn't want to be harmed or in any way, so they just moved up north along the, the the ridge and in the mountain area. And he, he says that, uh, you know, his father told him that you could see it was, you know, didn't you no know, shoes or anything, and then they left kind of like a bloody trail on their um, walking along the mountain ridges in that area. So these are like the stories that are coming out from 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 this project also, um, that were, we, you know, None of us would have known that if we didn't mm -hmm. 
uh, have this project going on because it was a story to, to Felix from his father. And perhaps the <coughs> and perhaps the clear story that is pervasive in all these documents is a story of resistance. Uh, it's really hard to find hard facts in terms of numbers, in terms of locations, because again, this was a colonial system trying to be imposed on these people, and and the fathers will struggle to understand it. They were like it was a very different way of life, and they will have summer camps and winter camps. People were moving all the time, so people were affected by disease even before the Spaniards will arrive, and people were dying in massive numbers by X number of causes. So in that regard, to understand, to to find hard facts that we can actually nail down, it's really hard. But what is pervasive is is this in so, sometimes in explicit way, sometimes in a more nuanced tacit way, is that the ways that the Tohono Odom and the Yasek Odom and all these different variations of people um, were affected by the colonial system, by the Spanish imposition of, of, of the rule, and yet they understood it very well and they, to the extent of possibilities, uh, deal with it, play with it, use it in, in their favor. So it's it's a story that is common along all the documents in that regard. It's a it's a it's a story of like uh, an effort to try to resist these like impositions uh, in the most in subtle and sometimes like or like violent ways. So it's it's, it's there. Uh, that is easier to find. Um, okay. Uh, we had a question about uh, the name of Magdalena again. Did, was the full name ever discovered, or was it just the phonemes at the end? Well, this is what we think it's called, Uk Wau, um, high cliff. Uk meaning high, and, and Wau being a cliff. Um, you know, Babo Kibri, the Babo Kibri is what we call uh, Wau Kiwork. Again, the, the Wau, B-A-B-O, Babo. So we kind of know that that's probably what it is. And then ook, um, the, we did kind of wonder if maybe it was a well. But um, all the other spellings that had well on there were a little different than this one. Um, so we, we said ook, wow. I think I've seen the name in one document, but God help me, I can't remember which one at this point. Um, so, but of course that is going to be the Spanish rendition of what it was. And one of the things that, that's adding layers of difficulty to what Ronald is doing is that um, the, the, what was being written by the Spaniards probably reflected different dialects also. So things that they were replicating were not necessarily how the Tona Atom would say them today. Mm -hmm. oh. okay. And uh, one, more, one more quick comment is that um, on the story that Ronald talks about that Felix has told about um, the people up on, on Baba Kivari, um, I'm thinking this is probably relating to um, an expedition that was mounted against them in the Mexican period in 1841 where they took refuge um, up on the mountains. Um, they also took refuge there during the Pima Revolt in 1751, but I suspect that that memory is not going quite back that far, or there could be some conflation there between the two events. So. Got a couple questions at this table. Uh, I, I don't know if, if you guys know that the Doris Duke American Indian Oral History Project many years ago had uh, Daryl Dolan spent a lot of time on the reservation uh, interviewing people, and he was interested in the so-called El Plomo War, which was 1898, when there was a big attack on El Plomo and a lot of Adam came across the line and and stayed. <laughs> um, and in the process of doing that, he picked up little bits and snippets of events that obviously were earlier than that. And one of them almost certainly is that 1840 to 42 war between the Adam and, and Mexico, really. Uh, and, and those tapes were gathered in Adam, and they should be in the State Museum. Uh, it would be an interesting thing to go back and listen to all of those 
those tapes that Dolan collected. Uh, and since it's winter, uh, I've got to tell a story. <laughs> uh, more than 30 years ago, uh, Danny Lopez, who was the late and very respected elder, although I used to kid Danny and say, Danny, I'm older than you are, but I'm not an elder, uh, <clears throat> went down to uh, Mexico. And it was the first time Danny had been in Mexico. And we went to, uh, among other places, San Ignacio, which is a beautiful little Adam, one-time Adam community north of Magdalena. And we climbed up on the roof of the church, and it was one of these beautiful days, and there was hardly anybody there. And Danny looked around, and he said, how many Adam are here now? And I started to laugh, and I said, Danny, there hasn't been an Adam in this village for, wow. you know, at least 50 or 60 years. And Danny kind of got a grim look on his face, and he looked very thoughtful, and he said, I'm going back home and get a bunch of kids and bring them down here and show them what can happen if they don't shape up. <laughs> I, I thought it was very interesting that you said uh, that these texts are very descriptive, and I was wondering if, if these people who are describing what they see are, are describing anything first or last? I mean, are they talking first about people? Are they talking about trees first or water or minerals? Is there any kind of like pattern in the text that you find? No, I wouldn't say there's any real pattering, patterning. Um, and what the kind of description that you get is going to vary with the individual who's writing and their own interests. Um, Manhe, for example, was charged with the task of not just um, escorting Kino along the frontier, but uh, kind of casing the landscape. Where uh, would be good places for farming? Where would be good places for grazing cattle or horses? And um, where were the water sources? Um, this was all really important information. And, you know, how many people were on the landscape? How many? He, he would often make comments about how this place could support probably 3,000 people. You know, the idea was always to, to get people um, reduced, in the Spanish term, reducido, into um, tighter communities rather than being scattered all over the landscape. Not understanding, of course, the um, environmental advantage to being scattered over the landscape. Um, on the other hand, you get, you know, some descriptions by Kino, but he's more interested in how many souls there are, and yeah, he's also interested in being able to, where, where can he run cattle, because he's very focused on supplying the missions in Baja California at that time. But the, um, you know, between the two, the probably the greater description will come from Manhe, on, in terms of what good anthropologists and archaeologists want to know. But it's, I, I can't say that there's a lot of patterning. And you also have to, um, you're not necessarily going to get a document that just lays it all out for you. You know, you might have to comb through a lot of documents to get um, the information that you're looking for. Well, I thought that sounded like rain. <laughs> Getting all excited. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Sometimes you'll hit a gold mine, and other times it's just, you know, you might have to go through a whole document and just get one tiny little phrase, maybe, that's helpful. Another question? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Gail. I'm sorry I didn't get your name, the anthropologist graduate student, gentleman. Rodrigo. Rodrigo. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, I think, sort of three questions. Where are you from in Mexico? How did you get interested in this theme, this subject? And do you see any changes in the political regime in Mexico regarding indigenous people, uh, whether there's any chance ooh, ouch, of, uh, of lands being more uh, available to them than they are now? Um, well, I was born in Mexico City. I studied anthropology in Mexico City for my bachelor, and then to finish it, I had to craft a 
thesis and so I choose the north part of the country because it's an area that has been like um, surprisingly abandoned by research for uh, Mexican institutions for research for anthropological research except like one, uh, a few magnificent exception, exceptions so I came in 2001 to the north part of the country and I uh, did field work with the Seri community uh, in the Gulf of California, and I also had the privilege to to meet uh, certain to know them people that live in Kitovac and in Gubo and in other areas, and um, I, I that's the way I got engaged with them. As archaeologists were trying to work in their land, and we were trying to negotiate for everything to run smoothly. Um, that's a different story, but that's the way I got into like inserted in this reality and it's it's been the biggest privilege of my life to to be part of it i have learned so much i um, um in terms of experience of engagement what i was talking about it's time back uh it just becomes part of you and then at some point i decided that i needed to see beyond and i came to to do my uh, phd here in anthropology to try to see beyond um it's i'm working on this um <laughs> But then I keep, I keep uh, working there. I'm doing my PhD with the Seri community in the Gulf. And then the, um, and I still have a lot of other friends. And uh, uh, I keep um, working on that. In relationship to your question about the political conditions right now in Mexico and how this is affecting indigenous communities, it. <sighs> um, I think it's basic, I mean, there are many answers to this and there's not a clear cut answer, obviously, but I think overall in Sonora, um, the structural conditions have been so in the last 50, 60 years in terms of how indigenous communities are have been excluded systematically for centuries, but especially, especially in the 20th century uh, to the you know, more distant, like isolated parts of the territory and to put in like this like, um, bad condition in the economic in the in the system of education in the economic system everywhere else that when something like the violence in Mexico right now it's taking place it's they are usually really vulnerable like they are the most vulnerable at some points I can give you many examples of how the Pimas communities the Pima communities like related to the Tohono them up in the Sierra of Sonora are being uh, suffering of extreme violence not not just in those in the last three or four years but in the last 15 years as like narco traffic tries to like uh like you know produce marijuana in their lands and they are just killed to get so so marijuana can be planted there if they resist the system or they are just incorporated and their ceremonies them the water heels you know have to hide in the forest so they can conduct their uh rituals so they so the you know like drug dealers with the Tecate in hand arrive and you know do all sort of atrocities. So there's many examples I can give you in all over Sonora about this. I don't think um, right now there's actually a better opportunity of them to get a, a better stand in terms of the possession of the land, quite the opposite. I think there are more and more pressure to be included as any other like uh, you know social sector in Mexico that is uh, experiencing you know, extreme poverty to be included in the effects of narco traffic and, and all what it comes along with it. Bernard, would you like to speak at all to what's going on just south of the border? Uh, we often get the, the, the question asked of us, um, are the autumn, uh, do they have a, 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 la a land like you do here in the United States? Do, you, do they have a reservation or a nation? And we tell them, um, no, uh, the autumn have kind of been left to their little ejidos, their, the land around their communities, and uh, they, uh, there is no system in Mexico that we have here in the United States that provides uh, education or health care or other things. And so a lot of our, our, our relatives that still live in Mexico will come to the United States for those services because they are tribal members. And so, um, Certainly, they're they're right right along our bound right along the boundary just south of the fence that was that is autumn land is being taken over by Mexican ranchers 
I, as I understand it, there is an, a, a, a law, an understanding in Mexico, if somebody uh, homesteads an area and can fence it off and can work the land for a period of five years, that that land becomes their land. And so because many of them have, have moved into the United States for education and for work, a lot of the, the, our traditional lands down there are, 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 don't have people living on them. And so these ranchers are coming in, fencing our land off, and then claiming it as their own. And so we're, we're losing that land, and we're not getting any support at all, I guess, because it's a whole different country, you know. And so um, that's, I think that's the situation today. Is that right, Joe? <laughs> Joe can answer this better. He spends a lot of time in Mexico. <laughs> It's true, you know, and this is the thing about a long time ago, way back when I came to work for the nation, there was a people that were trying to fight to get some of that land back, which I doubt they'll never get back. But, you know, this project that these people are doing up here is something that I know that they tried to use that to study the lands that belong to the autumn. This is how they were going to go about trying to get the the history and the documents, you know. And when I was on the council, I tried to get those guys to understand that hey, you got to go down to Mexico, go to Spain, and get the documents. So looked at the document. You know, at the time, a lot of people weren't really interested. I don't think because they never brought those things up. Yep, today. Our politicians say, well, okay, the Ottoman Mexico are part of us too, so but the, the word stops at the line. Mm -hmm. But for some of us that work both sides of the fence, you know, we're, we're used to seeing what's going on down there and, and the way that things are down there today. So it's, it's, it's still continuing to be uh, a challenge for all of us. And especially for those that are on that side. And, and then listen to these people talk about the stories. Just want to make a correction. I think there's only two of these areas north that are peep, that have peepash or maricopas on their reservation. Ak Chin, which is one of the little settlements uh, down there. If you know Arizona, if you know where Maricopa is, the little town of Maricopa, which now blossomed out to be everything in the desert, you know. That was the name of the town, so they thought that the community next door were part Maricopas, which they aren't. But some lady or some wealthy person that owned a little piece of land uh, southwest of that area included the three tribes, Ak Chin, Salt River, and Gila River, because they have Maricopas, or Pipas, as you people call them. So they gave them that piece of land. And Ak Chin is saying, how come we got into it? Because we don't have no peeposh people here. <laughs> well, well, you came into some land, so you might as well get used to it. You know. <laughs> but, but those are the things that you, know, you see today. And it's interesting when you travel down that way and you talk about all these sites and many things that are out there that all time should be aware of. And this is where my job comes in. You know, they tell me, well, you're supposed to protect and keep what is ours as autumn people. But on the other hand, you listen to these people say, okay, uh, you know, we want our children to know all this stuff. Well, that's up to us to, to teach these young people, like Danny Lopez, the late Danny Lopez said. You know, him and I grew up together as kids. We we're only two, two weeks apart. So we, we know what's happening, and we know what's going on since way back then when you got into education. But that's the thing that our people need today, or young people, is to learn. So I'm telling the young lady sitting over here about her kids back there. Back there. I hope they're taking it all in, you know, writing something down about what's happening here, because that's the only way we're going to keep ha hang on to our land. I'm always afraid. Government's going to come in and say, okay, we need your land. There goes our land. 
you know, there's a lot of things that's happening on both sides of the border, and where you know some of these trips that they're talking about that we're supposed to do and learn from what went on way back then, and how these lands were taken away. And if you go down to Tumacacri, you know, there's history down there about the Autumn people. And we just had a big ceremony of burial down there for all those guys. Like I said, they came in and baptized all these kids. People, they didn't know what baptism was. Hey, we had our own religion to begin with. Why do you come and tell us we can't worship this, we can't do this? You gotta follow my way. And these are the things that kind of bugs me sometimes because hey, I'm a free guy, you know, I wanna do what I wanna do. Learn from these mistakes that went on. And yet we encourage our people to do that, is to take a stand and follow the track of our ancestors. That's where we came from. So I wanted to share that, which is true. You know, it, it, on the other side of that line there, <coughs> but of course for us, it's just an imaginary line. Whatever happens mm -hmm. on that side, whatever goes on, it's still our land. Whether the two countries don't agree with it, it's still ours. And we still hold on to that. And the beliefs that you talk about, Sonoita, you talk about the Piña Catis. This is where we emerge from and spread throughout the lands where we have today. And so that's very sacred to us. And a lot of these tribes that came from the riverside came and left from there. And who stayed? The autumn. And so all this is our, ours to begin with. And we have to learn to protect it by learning what's going on here, by learning what is the uh, Spaniards or the missionaries that came here to try to tell us how to live in this world. And it's a different world from our world. But today, it's very different because our kids have to know that. Our kids have to stand by who they are, learn who they are first, then take it from there. As you get older, you know, you get, you get to the point where, hey, you went through all this system. You, I, I, like I say, I learned the outside world, the systems of the non-Indian guys. Okay, when you come back and you start living all this, you, give, you get so far, you get so high up here, and you say, I went to the top, now what do I do? Then you start thinking the autumn way, how they protected this and how these stories go and how everything goes and you start thinking that way. And it's very different because it takes you back to the beginning of your ancestors and how things were back then. So, you know, listen to these people today up here, you know, it, sitting back here thinking, yeah, it's true, you know, which, which side do we take? Do we want our kids to learn about everything else or we just tell them, hey, this is your world, you take care of your world the best you can. Or you go to the outside world and go to the moon or whatever you want to do. <laughs> but there'll be an Indian guy sitting up there waiting for you guys. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> okay, I think we're gonna call it quits with that. Um, what a fantastic and interesting project. I really can't wait to see where this all leads. And. Uh, Boy, howdy, I'd love to see some of this online because I think there's a lot of things we could learn from this. Um, just a couple of other, other items. Um, I, for those of you who uh, were here last month for Todd Soravel's talk, um, if you remember, he had said that there were only 14 known um, Paleolithic kill sites in North America. Well, two days later, we, we heard that down in Son northern Sonora, Grupo Mexico and the Institute National uh, of Anthropology and History just discovered the 15th site in North America with uh, Clovis materials in contact with uh, the remains of Gompathors, which is a type of, of ancient elephant. So we were all very excited by this news. If you want to read more about it, it hasn't really hit the American press yet, but if you go to our website and check uh, our newsletter, Southwestern Archaeology Today, the, week be the issue before this week's issue, that's the headline. It'll take you straight to an article all about it. Um, Next up, next is March 1st. Uh, Stephen Shackley is going to be here, and we'll shift gears just a little bit. And we're going to be talking all about obsidian, which uh, I know some of you will be very interested in. And um, once again, this has been made possible by the Center for Desert Archaeology. And if you're not a member of the center, um, your support through your membership puts these sorts of events on, along with a little extra help from the Arizona Humanities Council. 
and we'd really love to have you join up.